Hey there, goblins. Welcome to another episode of Goblin Salvage Rights. My name's Robert. And I'm Eric. And today we're talking about making monsters. As you can see, it's absolutely the season to be making monsters. So we figured we'd um we'd 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 get into costume and have a good time. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> Happy Easter, everyone. Oh, yeah, wait, no. Yeah, yeah. Wrong one. Uh yeah. Thanksgiving. Eat turkey. Eat turkey and be merry. Fuck, I got it wrong again. That's all right. Where are we, Robert? Is it Halloween? It's Halloween. Happy Halloween, yo. Yeah. Normally, this is where we thank our patrons, but we don't have any new ones yet. So, if you'd like to be thanked at the beginning of an episode, just like this, as well as uh, join special Discord channels in our Discord, as well as get access to a special video every single month, jump down to the description, avoid the hammer Eric's raising, and... Pop into our Patreon. We would greatly appreciate it. Uh, before we jump into the topic, making a monster, Eric, why don't you talk about what we played? I had a good time this last time. Um, did we decide that's because you weren't there or was that a- <laughs> Again, I was not there again. <laughs> oh my God. <clears throat> yeah, you missed it, so but much. we still had four out of five players. So that's enough to keep a game going. So I'm going to tell you what happened here. When last we met on Edgewatch, Ted and Elmo confer about the constant possession while Ajax and Vaz talk to the Grey Cloaks about their options. So we're deep in a dungeon right now with serial killers everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to uncover the whole plot, right? So uh, the Grey Cloaks, another cop organization in Absalom, their top guy here decides that they have to report all the new information back to their superiors. So they just make a run for it back the way they came. Bazarin, our local kobold, um, makes a copy of a map of this area he has for them so they can get out and avoid the monsters. Ted and Ajax figure out the Aradan statue puzzle, and then they continue on through. I feel like Eric is literally recapping for me as much as he is for you goblins That's at home. That's why I'm doing it this new way, yeah. <laughs> One of my players is just amazing about these recaps, and I wanted to yeah, do them a solid That's by, true. Uh, That's reading true. it out loud. Uh, and you know it's that player because the word fuck nook will appear at least two more times <laughs> in the course of this recap. <laughs> fuck nooks, man. We find another fuck nook full of stalactites that look like the original one all the way across the chasm. Ooh. Ajax hears two large gorilla demons telling bad jokes telepathically. Okay, one of them tells the bad jokes. The other one hates it. And an undead golem lady is guarding the entrance to the inner sanctum of this murder skin saw cult. So there's a big bad door and there are three very capable guardians in front of it. Now, they know that we're coming. And even though we try to come up with a plan, the golem lady hears us, slams the door in our face, says no. So Ajax, the party rogue, gets targeted by the golem during the subsequent combat. Uh, she wants his war razor because Ajax picked up a war razor. That's his new thing, apparently. Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. War razors are uh, they're an advanced weapon. Uh, 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 one of my friends in one of our games uh, plays uh, dual wielding war razors. Dual we that's just <clears throat> total like Barbara Fleet Street. I know, I know, I Sweeney it. Todd. Yeah, they're yeah. they're really weird weapons. I really like them. So uh, what happens? Um, blah blah blah. Where'd we go? War razor. Yeah, um, they have a good time. So yeah, they they have a big old combat. And uh, Vaz manages to sideline one of the demons by shoving him off the cliff into the chasm, uh, even, evening what? the playing field. It was, it was legit. Crazy. That's crazy. Elmo comes in clutch with the heels and divine lances. We finally manage to finish everyone off and steal the golem's weird wooden shoes. Little <laughs> Dutch shoes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Sometimes you just got to keep it weird to throw them off, you guys. <laughs> Uh, no details too strange. We also notice that the golem had a surveillance rune tattooed on her neck. Mm. Same as the one that Ted, part of the party monk, got from the Dreaming Palace, which is the murder hotel. So we let everyone know we're on our way. Then we take uh, 20 to 30 minutes to rest heal up. Ajax's knife, the little uh, uh, Sweeney Todd thing, it starts to skitter away from him with little scorpion legs. So this uh, weapon is not just a war razor and everybody at the table realizes this at the exact same time oh my god including gosh. that player so that, that that's was a fun little crazy yeah. i can't believe i missed that we're, we're about to go into this just creepy as fuck inner sanctum of murder skin saw cults and one of our weapons all of a sudden can't be trusted oh my god that's, that's where i eat you guys i love that kind of stuff that's awesome so keep your players off guard when you can 
they decide not to go through the front door because they're smart. Uh, we explore the side tunnel for shits and giggles and find a back door. We figure it's probably better to go in through the back now that they're expecting us <laughs> from the front. Ajax and Ted sneak in through happen. the door. Ted stubbing her toe. And pay attention here because Draygrid's coming up. Okay. Uh, okay. Ted stubs the toe with a botched stealth check. Surprise, surprise. And finds a skin saw doctor standing over someone chained to a table in an awful torture chamber. Ted uses the bad stealth to draw attention away from Ajax, which was just really cinematic and cool and totally apropos. Um, away from Ajax. And the doctor mentions that she's going to have Ted skinned alive and made into a suit by Jalel. Oh. Ted freaks the fuck out. And Ajax assassinates the doctor. And that's where we left the. Uh, oh my gosh. Left so Jalel is the husband of one of my uh, orc NPCs who's really big in the criminal underworld. So think of like an orc John Wick. Uh, his husband, an elven tanner that we met <clears throat> yes. before the bank robbery, he's a skin saw cultist. Oh my that God. That was the big reveal, plus Ajax's skittery little weapon. Oh my God. And, uh, and if you guys don't remember, the uh, Norgorber, uh, his favorite animal is uh, scorpions, arachnids. Mm. So the little scorpion legs on the, on the little nice blade. Nice touch, nice touch. Yeah, it just sort of, it, things are starting to connect in really uncomfortable ways. Now that we're far away from help. Yeah. And, uh, that, that, that was a lot of fun. It really sucks that you missed it, but I totally understand because, you know, you have a real life outside of I life. escaped, I played my own game. Yeah. Uh, called do? Escape from Florida, <laughs> and I survived. Yeah, I went to I went to visit some family uh, over that weekend for a wedding. Of course, mm -hmm. they had to pick the right weekend for me to miss. Um, so yeah, I was in Florida celebrating the union of two of my favorite people. So yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Some of the best brisket I have ever had in my freaking life. Like literally top ten, and I had barbecue while back in Florida like three or four different times mm -hmm. you know because that's the south yeah you guys talk about barbecue the way people in New York talk about pizza it's wild but yeah. my literally my cousin who got married has three Traegers on the family property and they used all three of them for three different meats we had Traegered brisket that's Traegered legit. pork Traegered uh, chicken mm -hmm. and of course the pr brisket went out first I had like three plates on my own so Oh, that's it awesome. Was, I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah, it was great. It Are was they still great. together? <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah, as far right. as I know. I mean, you know. Yeah. So that's a, <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's all I got. I, yeah, I am yeah, sweltering yeah. in this, you guys. Okay, I'm okay. going to take this off. Okay. Uh, and oh, wow. Humanity. Yeah, you're definitely covered in sweat. Wow. For the listeners uh, at home who are watching the YouTube video, oh. Oh. Eric is covered. All right. The yep. hat looks great on you, though. That looks oh, great. Thank you. It's got a little I'll tag. I'll take it. Yeah. So awesome. I'm, I'm All right. Now. So let's uh, let's jump into this topic. I think we made got... monsters. That yeah. was fun because I'm not used to making and crunching monsters. So having to go through this book, which is like, what is it? Six or seven or eight pages worth of crunchy rules mm -hmm. uh, in order to legitimately make a balanced monster. was a really interesting exercise for me because I tend to hand wave a lot of stuff, but I wasn't allowed to for this exercise. Yeah, I really loved this exercise as well. I think any DM, any DM who is, or GM, sorry, GM, and we're Game Masters now. I know, Watsy owns the, the, owns the rights to two letters put together. Um, so any GM out there who is interested in upping their game, or any player out there who's interested in understanding how the game is balanced, needs to read this chapter. It's chapter, it's page 56 of the Game Mastery Guide, mm -hmm. from 56 to 74, and it literally lays out the thought process with which all monsters are effectively created. Sure. Um, <clears throat> which is important to make as a distinction because how the rules you use to create a player character are different mm -hmm. from the rules you use to build a monster, which are also different from the rules you use to build an NPC. So there's some overlap, but each one has its own distinct uh, map to it. Yeah, absolutely. And once you kind of learn how to build a monster, you can start moving it into NPCs and like epic boss fighty type of critters with their own stat blocks. Yeah. Absolutely. And what I love about this is there's a bunch of tables. I'm a sucker for some good tables. The, the tables are the only way I got through this exercise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they do a really excellent job laying out um, the way you create a monster. They do everything step by step in a way that's very uh, cogent and cohesive and understandable. Mm -hmm. um, the very first or second page literally has like a quick to do list of things. Yeah. And I found that going out of order could was actually kind of helpful here and there because I already 
the concept for my monster was so locked in. And we'll, we'll, our, the first article, first article we're going to get to it is conception here. So maybe I'm jumping the shark. But my idea was so locked in at at from square one. Yeah, I kind of jumped around from all of the different um, steps because some just made obvious sense to me. Sure, and others I kind of had to kind of had to work on and, and yeah. chew on. You know what I mean? I did the whole like leave nothing blank and then circle back and redo it. Oh, um, okay, that, gotcha. Because I kept trying to get like the perfect option for each step, and. That, that's a good way to not finish anything ever. Yeah. So I just, you know, I just slammed things into the different categories and then came back and then started working on the so-called balance. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Cool. So if let's... you guys have this book, the Game Mastery book, I strongly recommend for this episode in particular, if you want to follow along, uh, like normally we ramble mm-hmm. and we kind of bunny trail and yeah. do that sort of thing. Uh, this chapter right here he's referring to, what is this, page 56, 57? Yep, page 56. Um, just follow along while we're talking. I promise you it will make sense, and this will keep us all on track. I'll also put the link to the Archives of Nethys section on Monster sure. Creation for people who don't have the book. Yeah. Um, highly recommend buying the book, especially on this one. I don't recommend buying all the books that Paizo puts out, but having the jams guide in front of you, especially while you're jamming, is mm-hmm. hella useful. Yeah, a large percentage of our actual videos are straight out of this book. That's mm-hmm. how much we adore this thing. Yeah, it's it's easily one of the best Game Master guides that has ever well, been seen. written. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, right off, uh, so we're going to break this video up into five different sections. Uh, conception, purpose, art, and stats kind of come one and they, they kind of, that's step three and four. You can they're interchangeable. Mm-hmm. And then step five, how do you implement the monster? So let's That's get started with the first step, which is conception. Conception. Where does the idea come from? Exactly. How did you come up with your monster? What is your monster? Well, my monster is not the monster I started with, nor is it the one that I trashed the first one to come up with a second idea. This one's actually my third iteration of trying to get through this exercise and be excited about something. Really? I, I thought for sure I was going to create um, a thing. And then I started to do it and it just got really boring really quick. So this chapter helped me to understand the things that I think I like, but don't really. Hmm. And it helped me to, you know, blow through the math. So to answer your question, I wanted to do a monster that was not a one and done. I, I, I get really tired of these monsters that show up for a session just long enough to get stuck through the eye with the sword. And then you take all their belongings and run out. And that's the history of the monster in your game. Um, it's it's fun for one-offs and that sort of thing, but I'm more of a, a long-form story campaign guy, so I like my monsters to stick around. So the first thing I knew I wanted to do when I finally dialed in the monster that I created for this mm-hmm. was I wanted a monster that was going to exist across five levels or so of play. So I picked a level five monster, Okay. and the the premise for this monster is it shows up in your campaign at level one, and then it sort of sticks around through five levels. And then you have the epic boss fight. <laughs> the purpose, why that monster is here. At this level five. is the most typical Eric shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> He's building the monster to be able to escape the players and come back and stab them in the kidneys time and time again. <laughs> His BBEGs never die, ladies and gentlemen. They never die. I love foreshadowing. I love seeding. Um, I love kind of like throwing out red herrings and keeping players guessing and going, is this relevant to the thing or is this, I, hmm, I better watch my steps and ask more questions and be more careful. Um, so I, that, this, every, everything we've just said is kind of how I wanted to build this monster. I, I wanted not a one and done monster, but a monster that sort of scales with the players, um, a monster that will be around for the long haul. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> this is a little bit later, but I'll go ahead and spoil it for you now. I wanted a monster that was uh, that was strongly linked to one of the four or five PCs at the table. Mm. Not everybody is a group, but one that's strongly and firmly tied into one character's story. Uh, in Agents of Edgewatch, that's kind of how I built a lot of my monsters. The Time Panther is strongly linked to, to Draegrid, your mm-hmm. character. The, uh, the first serial killer is the uncle of the halfling sorcerer. So I, I like my monsters to feel personal. And the way to do that is to connect them to something. Right. So uh, I I made sure to like triple down on this one when I uh, took that approach. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's a great approach. Yeah, Absolutely. it works for me and it keeps you guys happy. I mean, you're still playing this fucking <laughs> yeah. game after what, two and a half years yeah. and we're in book two. I mean, like players like feeling special. 
mm-hmm. players like having their moments. Yeah. And when you make an NPC that chases after a specific player that the rest of the party then has to deal with, yeah. the whole time the other PCs get to rib that player and be like, oh my God, what did you do? <laughs> you know, you had one job. Yeah, it, was, exactly. it was to nullify this threat. Exactly. And you yeah. failed at that. Now we have to sol- help you solve your Barley problem. Barley Bramble, stop making shitty decisions. <laughs> So, um, so my, my concept came from a picture. Pictures inspire me sure, yep. greatly. Um, I'll put a picture of the monster up here on the screen right now. Uh, so right now I'm working on my own homebrew setting. Yep. It's this idea that has been stuck in my mind. I've had a Pinterest board for years now. That's just called setting. Mm-hmm. That's been stuck there. And <laughs> and um, I finally decided, you know, we're going to get started on this thing. It's been cooking. It's been cooking. Mm-hmm. And now I think it's finally t- uh, time to like start pulling things out of the oven. if you right. will. Yep. So this is literally probably my first step towards pulling. <laughs> For everyone's listening, I'm Eric, listening, I promise. Eric is ripping a tag <laughs> out of his hat uh, with his teeth uh, like a manly man. Um, so long story short. This is a death watcher. My creature is a death watcher. There's this a beautiful death picture. Watcher. They a watch death watcher. Death. Exactly. So there are going to be four major factions in my in my setting. Mm-hmm. One of those major factions is rep, try is there to represent law in a sense. I want to take the classic, um, uh, the classic law chaos. Yeah, yeah. Dichotomy. Throw it out, but still have remnants of it sitting around everywhere. Um, in my setting. And I want to take those remnants and kind of twist people's assumptions about oh, sure. yeah. what uh, what law represents and stuff like that. So in this case, law represents the undead because they're unchanging. They're timeless. Okay. They are pristine. They are, uh, in my setting, they'd be obsessed with beauty and elegance and um, uh, like filigree and things like that. You say that and I think like, vampires and such not but so there are zombies there are not any vampires as least yet in my set and is that loud is that's apparently allowed it's your setting you can do whatever you want um in my setting is vampires yeah imagine like undead timeless creatures who um literally farm humans okay to creepy it to, to grow their ranks I, it's still a weak concept I'm playing with. Sure. Each of the factions in the group is going to be farming humans in some way. And okay. the only playable races in the beginning of the campaign of, of any campaign would be humans, at least for the foreseeable future. Sure. And if you wanted to become corrupted or gain power from one of these four factions, they will change you mm-hmm. in a way. And that's how you get access to the closest thing to ancestors, which would be through the free archetype rule. And I would make, um, I would make a specific kind of archetype for each one. Obviously, undead is already taken care of, right? Mm-hmm. So where does my monster fit in in all of this? Well, the undead here, they're farming humans. Okay. And if you look at the picture on screen, it is a wrapped, I could show Eric, so he has an idea. I think he's already seen it, though. Um, it is a what, what looks like a wrapped creature with wings, a humanoid creature with wings, and then it's got a shawl over its bed, head, and that shawl is completely black, so you can't see its face. Okay. And that's because it doesn't have a face. What these creatures do is they, they sit atop buildings. The humans know them as angels. And another concept I had in this whole creation of my setting and stuff like that is I like the idea of humans having very limited knowledge vis-a-vis players having very limited knowledge. So everything I put in normal text is what players get to learn. Everything I put in parentheses is what only DMs. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Oh, wow. And it really, it really um, distorts the perception of um, the players because when they're interacting with other people in the town and when I describe what they grew up with, there are these beautiful angels that sit atop buildings Mm -hmm. and whisk away the um the 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 recently dead off into heaven mm-hmm. where they might find peace. Is it heaven or is it like heaven? It is heaven. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> so my monster is basically there to collect dead. And, so your monster and, is a sort of psychopomp? It, it without using the IP? 
He, my monster is... A harbinger of souls to the afterlife? Not so much, because what they're really doing is they're collecting bodies, mm -hmm. keeping their souls intact, or whatever I've come up with for as a conception for soul. I have mm -hmm. a couple ideas yet, but they're still very, very new. They basically cast gentle repose and, and whisk these bodies away mm -hmm. to be sorted in a sorting facility. Okay, that's just fucked up. Where they get to where and the sorters decide where um, the bodies go, basically. Okay. You know, uh, if it's a, my idea right now is if it's a strong soul um, who's been through a lot of hardship and overcame it or maybe something like that, that means that they can be turned into more powerful undead. And then they get auctioned off. And the different undead factions within this undead empire basically barter and bid for these souls. And then that's how they grow their ranks. So if I'm hearing you right, your process, which is not a Robert process by any stretch of the imagination, this isn't how I understand you to to do this sort of thing. Okay. You you looked at a picture, you got inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that I added it to, to an, a, I added it to a Pinterest board years ago. Oh, okay. So this has been uh, percolating for a while. Yes. And from that inspiration you took from the picture, you did a bit of world building, probably more in addition world to what you've already done. World building is my favorite thing to do. And then the stat block came later. Exactly. I, I assumed your stat block would come first. No, but that's absolutely a, th not. This is the opposite of what I expected. I, I, did I my, like this. I did my best to use the stat block to serve the purpose of I world prove. building. <laughs> Please don't hammer my table. <laughs> So yeah, that's my conception. I started off with this awesome photo mm -hmm. and I kind of already had in my mind um, these these angels whisking away humans into the quote unquote afterlife. Sure. Heavy inspiration from Final Fantasy 14, the um, the uh, expansion, I think it's called Endwalkers. Uh, I got to 12 and stopped. Yeah, so. I know. 14's uh, MMORPG. Endwalkers was the one I started playing the game on. I don't play it anymore. Mm -hmm. but um, Well, yeah, you got to pay rent now. Yeah, exactly. I had a really <laughs> good time though. And I really loved a lot of the, um, a lot of the ironies and, you know, uh, turning tropes on its head that they did there. Sure. And of course, as everyone knows, I'm a huge fan of From Software's Dark Souls series and everything like that. I really like the concept of angels and these beautiful angelic creatures actually being fairly ugly in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but still serving a purpose. So I took this photo. I had this general idea that I wanted them to get... These are the fairies that whisk bodies away to the undead to get them to turn them into undead. Mm -hmm. But the humans see them as saviors and protectors. That's the important part. There's a human perception, the humans that are getting effectively farmed. And then there's a, um, an un, a, a reality, a gross reality that, of course, that that veil will be lifted for the players. And they're going to be like, oh, my God, what? Sure. So, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Okay. Oh, there's another anime that everyone's probably not everyone. There's an anime that's really popular called Promise Never Neverland, I think it, it is. And it's quite literally this concept taken to like... I know nothing about this. An extreme. You know, talk to me about it. Yeah, let us know in the comments if you've seen Promise Never Neverland or whatever. That's a fucked up manga. Uh, and anime now, too. But yeah, so that's where my, um, that's where my conception of the monster came from. It, turned okay. from. it was basically a picture and an idea about a setting and world building that I wanted to emphasize with the creature. Okay. Yeah, so jumping on to the second, I guess I kind of already answered that question. Is purpose. Yeah, I, I was, we're, we're jumping around in this already, I mean, which is totally already, fine. because it, it's, they're, uh, they're very related. Natural. They're very related. So tell me about the purpose of this monster in your, in um, your game. I mentioned a moment ago that the, the purpose of, or function of this monster in a campaign is to help draw out a character and inform the character's story, a singular character in a group, and give them something to rail against and kind of push back against and, uh, you know, run away from and try to puzzle out what, what the hell's going on here. Right. So I, uh, I really like non-standard TTRPGs. I mm -hmm. like the, uh, the planescapey. I like the uh, dream sequences. I like the, um, I like the stuff that goes weird and conceptual. And I really wanted to do something like that. You know, I'm a super fan of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman series. Mm -hmm. And I draw a ton of inspiration for my, you know, gothy stuff from that. And uh, since this is a Halloween episode, I wanted to, you know, go down that road, do something creepy and dark and gothy. So what's the purpose of this critter in my game? I just wanted somebody who was going to be a face for one character's problem for five levels to start out with. At level five, presumably the boss fight's done and there's going to be a new problem after that. So the function is to give um, that player and that character 
something to like like a rail to hold on to while they're trying to figure out their character and learn their character because none of us really know what our characters are at level one no we just put a bunch of numbers together and go okay i was a farmer because that's my background or a sailor and i'm a fighter because i get tired of missing things when i roll dice all the time (laughs) (laughs) literally why i built a fighter so uh and it's it's going well (laughs) i never fucking miss the only time i miss is when i roll a one it's the strangest thing so it's, it's feast or famine um, mostly feast, but the uh, the idea of uh, of having an NPC that is a monster, yeah, that has other monsters around it, oh, that the player and you know by extension the the party have to interact with these threats from level to level to level. It gives them something like a reference point to build deeper into their characters around. What's that? I'm having trouble with dreams as my first level character. Okay, that that tells me what kinds of questions I can start asking, what mm. kinds of research I can start doing. I, I want my monsters to give my players clues on how to participate within the story. Otherwise, they'll just sit there and go, am, am, am I ready to roll initiative yet? Mm. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. It's interesting. We both have a, you have a hard dream aesthetic, a hard dream focus on your character. Mine has a minor on your monster. Mine is a minor dream focus okay as well how do you I, mean minor dream focus uh they speak to people through dreams and, oh, okay and influence oh that is interesting town did denizens. you use the tag dream anywhere in your monster i should have maybe yeah i that's that's it's not gonna cost anything I, and it won't fuck with the math yeah that's a mistake i made i tried to stick to the tags that were in this right the me, ones. list back here mm-hmm. but i didn't even think of that you know i popped open my best year three mm-hmm. and i looked for all the challenge rating seven monsters mm-hmm. because i wanted a monster that could fly and it's you're supposed to have a seventh level characters before you start getting into that yeah, territory. Yeah. And uh, I just it, it didn't work out. I, I needed to scale it back to fifth level, but I really wanted them to fly. So I I, I did some things to kind of make it work. But uh, I, I basically had the best cherry open, and I took a look at all the monsters at seventh and then fifth level, and I found uh, an aberration because mine's an aberration, mm-hmm. a, a dream aberration. Mm. Um, and um, I, I tried to figure out like how did they pick the tags? Is there a math to it? Why not have ninety nine tags? Why, why do some only have one tag and others have five tags and others have like eight tags? Wh- where's the math? I- am I going to break something if I throw dream, aberration, um, planar, you know, necromancy, whatever, and just keep stacking them? Mm-hmm. And apparently the answer is no. Well, okay. It's, it's a yes and a no thing. We're, we're obviously skipping around, which is what we love to do. Mm-hmm. Tags serve an imp- important purpose because they allow you, they allow players to identify stuff. Yes. And sometimes they can ad- identify stuff more easily because mm-hmm. of the tag. Other tags like undead mm-hmm. come with a bunch of immunities. They come with baggage. Sure. Abyssal comes right. with more baggage. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, angels and devils, demons and all exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So depending on the tag, mm-hmm. it'll add baggage and it'll add math. And sometimes it won't. Sometimes the tag doesn't do anything. So long as it's appropriate, just slap them on. Really, it's does the tag add mechanics that make mm-hmm. your monster more difficult to kill or more difficult to, to interact with? Yeah. And something else about tags that I really like, and um, I might be presuming too much here, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, one of my pet peeves in, uh, in this hobby is when one player says, hey, I have a question. Uh, I'm going to, can I check and see if this monster has an allergy to sunlight? And then they fail. And then the next player goes, yeah, me too. Can I roll that too? No, you can't. It wasn't your fucking idea. Stop that. Come up with your own ideas. So if there's a tag that says dream, and the monster has the tag that says dream, and the player has knowledge, dreams, that difficulty class just goes way down. So it makes it more, uh, certain areas of the game are easier to unlock for certain mm-hmm. characters than they are for everybody else at the table. So it helps to nip that obnoxious player number two thing. Yeah. Uh, right in the bud. And that's... It's, 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 it's painful. It's a painful thing to see at the table, but I also don't blame them for wanting more knowledge. I don't either. Like, especially, I mean, especially No, that's you. not true. I totally do. But I, I see your argument. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you of all people as a player love knowledge. Like mm-hmm. you want to know as much as possible at any given time, right? Yeah. And at the same time, I, I, if somebody says, "Hey, I I have the agency to ask this question to dig deeper into the story," right. that moment belongs to them. Yeah, that's Just true. Just because they fail at it doesn't mean I should swoop in and yeah. scoop it up. But that's uh, a good point. It, that's that's enough about that. So the purpose of my creature, yeah, is predominantly a world building piece. I don't expect the players to 
What do you put in my beer? It's it's hitting me harder than it's like a six percent beer. Yeah, it's okay. just a pumpkin beer. Because you make me like hard booze, and I don't yeah, feel like this yeah, early yeah, in an episode. True, true. Yeah. Elysian uh, releases like pumpkin beers every year, and my partner is infatuated by them. So mm-hmm. once a year, we buy like it's a good taste a sixteen pack or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I don't really drink a lot. Um, we don't really drink a lot anymore. So it might be a seven pack by the time I go home. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Um, they're definitely tongue scrapers, though. You can only <laughs> have like one or two of them, and then you're like, all right, I'm done. Um, but yeah, my the majority of my character's my monster's purpose is to build this idea and interact with the players when they're still in their town, when they still have the wool pulled over their eyes. Sure. This is going to be one of those big moments where I describe people talk about a thing in one way mm-hmm. and describe it in one way, and then one day one of the players actually asks me to take a look at the photo and sure. show them the photo, and they're like, "Ah, uh, excuse me, <laughs> let's rewind a bit." Exactly. <laughs> so I love that. That's kind of my point, but I, I built the character, but the monster, I keep calling it a character, in a way that if they interacted with it at cert, at a certain level, they would just get creamed. Um, and I built it in a way that it can serve the purpose of its world building mechanically. Sure. So that's the purpose. It's predominantly world building mechanic, but if the players ever did decide to interact with it in some way, um, maybe it whisks them away or yeah. something like that later. I love that. It's, it can. it's a monster that informs combat. It informs plot. It informs world building. It, uh, it, it checks a lot of boxes. Mm. It's not a, uh, uh, who's that famous cook that everybody loves? Alton Brown. Mm. Is he still a thing anymore? I don't oh, know. Yeah. Alton Brown's the shit, but it, he's a big thing on like, you can't have a unitasker in yeah. your kitchen. You can't have a singular item that only does one thing and serves one purpose. So your monster is not a unitasker. It's my not monster a, is not a unitasker, and it sounds like we're both playing around in the same sandbox. For it's that. not a unitasker, but I built it to do one specific thing really well. Okay, which is world build. It's there to world okay. build. I built it with the purpose of world building, mm-hmm. but i i gave it uh, I gave it enough thought to make it able to act in other places if it needed to. Did you trip into that idea or did you start with that idea I when you saw the picture? I started with that. I've had, I had a really strong core concept of what I wanted this thing to do mm-hmm. from the very beginning. And that's, that made it easy in a lot of yeah. ways. I know this is a lot of rambling or at least it sounds like it, but I think this is really important because what we're talking about here is creating original content for your table. Yeah. And everybody wants their original stuff to feel like it has value. And it does just, by the fact that you put it together, it has value. Mm-hmm. But by by taking the consideration to ask these questions, you can build some lasting moments at the table that people remember for a long time. And what you describe is exactly that. So it's it, I think it's worth taking the time to talk mm-hmm. about process. Yeah, absolutely. Not just what how, did how the mechanics the work exactly. Yeah. And we're going to do an episode. I'd like to do an episode on the mechanics and how they actually work. Yeah, in a synthesized way that's not so. Um, yeah, and we can have a series of examples and exactly do that. Yeah, yeah. So. Really, I asked myself the question, what was the what what's the core purpose of this monster? What does it need to do first and foremost? Sure. Is it a world building piece? Is it gonna drive a plot device? Is it gonna be a BBEG? Is it gonna just be a set dressing piece, a world building piece? Like what and is those the are core all distinct purpose? ideas for you? To me, they're 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 core directions to sail in. Sure. Okay. It's you know, if if I've got a destination I'm sailing towards mm-hmm. and that's where my heading is pointed. And if my head at end ends up, you know, north by northwest or even northwest, I'll eventually get to where I need to be going. Gotcha. But it's okay. easy. It's really helpful for me to have a, a, a distinct and dis, a distinctive destination sure. to where this monster, what purpose is this monster serving? And world building was your distinct. World building yeah. was my and destination. For me, it was creating that that seminal moment for one specific character at the table exactly. and that player. Exactly. And it can do, the monsters can do other things. Check all the boxes, yeah. But you need it to check that box first, and yeah. that's a guiding a light. primary focal point. The, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so yeah I, I dig it, I dig my, it. My big recommendation when doing this is have one of those purposes. Start off with it. Decide that before you ever pick stats. Because once you figure it out, everything else will fall into place. Mm-hmm. It's it, Once you have like that core idea, everything just... And just put it into a short sentence with a period at the end. Exactly. Something you can just drop on an index card. Exactly. You and your index cards. I swear <laughs> to God. Hey, it's my thing. Oh I, my I don't God. have very many things. It's like the most Gen X thing possible. I'm not... Gen, well, I'm, I'm half Gen X. Okay, okay, okay. So next up, I put art and stats kind of next to each other. Just because some people a lot of times won't have, they won't get inspired by art originally. Mm-hmm. They'll get inspired by an idea and then they'll move on 
and they'll be like, all right, this is kind of what I, this image I have in my mind. Sure. If you're having that problem and you don't want to, you don't feel ready yet. You have your characters, you have your creature's purpose, but there are just too many questions in your mind. Find art. Oh yeah. Art first, then stats. Yeah. Talk more about that. Because you're uh, like the art man. I love Pinterest, but you yeah. are an art Yeah, fan. like anything else in the world, it's less about the answer and more about the question. So knowing how to ask the question to get the answer you're looking for is really at the crux of this conversation. Chat GPT is the exact same thing. And I want to talk at some point in the future about how to use mm. that to create um, adventures by asking relevant leading questions. Interesting. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I actually wrote down what I had here. I think my... Uh, what do you call it? My Google search was like five or so words. I think it was, um, yeah, here it is. Slit pupil with tentacles art. That's it. Okay. I did that and it was literally the 12th image that popped up. So you just, I did an aberration based on something that's purely in my imagination that I have never seen before. And Mm. I knew there wasn't going to be art for it. I just knew it. So I tried to do a moonshot and land among the stars with this one. And I knew I needed um, vertical slit pupils. Mm -hmm. I knew I needed an eyeball. And I knew I needed tentacles associated with it. And I figured something Cthulhu was going to pop up just because that's the popular culture at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, The fantasy zeitgeist is all Cthulhu all the time. So somebody out there drew something close to this. And I thought maybe I could just do a hatchet job uh, to some art, take what I like, transfer it over to this uh, um, app, and then doctor it up a bit. But I found something that was close enough to what I needed. And since I'm dealing with the dream imagery, it almost doesn't matter what my monster looks like as long as that long vertical slit mm. of, a, uh, uh, of a pupil existed somewhere in the art. So you had like, a, it sounds like you had a distinct piece of art, a, a, a property in the image that you needed to have. Yep. And then you just followed that trail until a you large found creature something. with a 10 foot tall pupil mm. that was slit like a cat's or a reptile's gotcha. or a Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. That's probably going to be the, the best example I can mm. use going through the rest of this video. Yeah. Think of the eye of Sauron when you think of mine. Gotcha. And then we'll undress it from there and figure out what it really looks like. Interesting. Yeah. And so then obviously for me, backwards I started that. with art yeah. and I kind of walked into everything else because yeah. art inspired the world building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, Know what question you want to ask Google or Chat GPT, and or ask Pinterest. it again, and ask it again, and ask it again. Pinterest, yeah, uh, any of these images. Yeah, I love softwares. what I love about Pinterest is you can create a board mm-hmm. and, of a couple different photos that you like, and then it will use its own search AI or whatever sure. to come up with like things and suggestions. And it used to be really good, and now it's garbage. But what? it's still a place to keep it. Yeah, I was using Pinterest like from beta, dude, uh, way back in the beginning, and it's just it's gotten cluttered and fucked since then uh the like sarah ads, and i don't use it anymore yeah the ads are obnoxious but i i don't i don't agree with that yeah. i think it's still it works for you it totally a works. great way to yeah i think it's still a great way to find art and one of the things i love about it is it's easy for me to go and find artists mm-hmm. a lot of times you know it's sometimes you find a cool image online yeah. you try to reverse google image search it mm-hmm. and you can't find the original artist anywhere yeah and because like if you made this you probably made other shit that's just like sure. this that's fucking awesome yeah but yeah, going wherever the watering holes are that artists uh, frequent. Yeah. You know, whether it's uh, deviant art, if that's still a thing. Um, Pinterest, like you said. Mm-hmm. And there, there's probably a short list of them that everybody's using in totally. the art world. Uh, find those and mm-hmm. find a way to ask the questions to get you to what you're looking for. Exactly. So, exactly. And cool. use as few words as possible. So I guess we're going to dive into the meat and potatoes of this, which is stats. And that really leads to how does this whole fucking thing work? Like, how do you actually go about making a monster? I got this cool idea. I've got um, what is I've got its purpose. I've got some art. What comes next, Eric? Oh boy, um, I have two ways I want to do this, and neither of them involve numbers. Okay, so you know how like in the bestiary, every monster entry uh, has that blurb about like not necessarily the history of the monster, but it informs you about what the monster is. Yeah, um, kind of like what you're describing, where you said this is the stuff the player knows and this is the stuff the GM knows, that sort of thing. Uh, I haven't really talked about mine yet. So okay. I feel like in order for my numbers to make sense, I need to talk a little bit about the beastie. Do it. Like, where do they come from? So what I have here is something I'm calling, and I picked this cheesy name on purpose. Okay. It rhymes with nightmare. Okay. And I'm calling it night glare. Okay. All one word. It's an I, it glares. Ha ha ha. Funny yeah, joke. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, it's on, it, I have the notes for this episode. Oh my gosh. In, my little coat. Oh my which is gosh. The punch on my back right here. 
And he that's says what all he, this is. He says he's not a boomer, but here he is handwriting notes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you all right now. <laughs> So what I have is a night glare. And what is a night glare? So this is a large size creature, okay. four squares, 10 feet tall. And it's basically an eyeball with red veins mm -hmm. like we have. So imagine bloodshot eyes, mm -hmm. but the veins are tentacular. They reach around and they grapple and wrestle and they go Ooh. pow, pow, pow uh, when they separate. So imagine a long slit iris, um, not iris, pupil. The pupil is visible. It's black. And the veins are blood red mm. and they're visible. Everything else about the eye is not visible. So in the underdark, if you're looking through a black doorway, you see black. So it's easy to walk right into one of these things, almost mm. like that little uh, demon mask in the, uh, in the Tomb of Annihilation. Mm. Uh, so it's, uh, that, that's part of the, the whole thing. So these little bad boys come from the, um, the domain of dreams, the dimension of dreams. And that's a very Lovecraftian thing. It goes all the way back to the first AP volume in uh, uh, Pathfinder. And they s essentially kind of wander in and out of the dreamscape. When they hunt, they come over to the Darklands and they look for civilized areas and they look for small creatures, you know, two sizes smaller. Mm -hmm. So they have harder time, you know, wrestling unless they have tit uh, Titan wrestling. Got it. Uh, they're easier to manhandle. So they go after gnomes, they go after dwarves, they go after, you know, the shorter races, gotcha. uh, ancestries. And they, uh, they study their dreams. They, they stalk them. They follow them for hours, days, weeks, months at a time. And they just monitor their dreams. And they monitor their dreams. And the little deep gnomes, Furf Neblin, is dreaming their little mushroom dreams in the deep. <laughs> and everything's fine. And then an uncomfortable moment happens. You know, maybe your, your deep gnome has indigestion before it went to bed. Upset and it, stomach. It, diarrhea. Upset. Hey, pepto is Right. It, bad mushrooms. It happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tell us your bad shroom stories down oh in the comments. Oh, my God. <laughs> so let's say that happens, and you have a moment in one of your dreams where the indigestion manufactures a piece of your subconscious in a, in a, in a small, not a nightmare, but something strange happens. Mm. Well, this creature, that's nourishment to this creature. And this creature is sort of like, you know, like, like a hobo wandering through the grocery store, sampling things, <laughs> reaching into the little bucket, <laughs> popping a cashew or two and continuing hey, on I down. Hey, do, I do that. Uh, yeah, I was describing <laughs> this specific yeah, hobo okay, right here. Yeah. And uh, it's just sort of like a dream grazer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a subsistence living for this thing. Yeah, and it's, it's, that's what it needs to survive. What it's really hoping for, though, is to get that juicy piece of trauma in that character, Ooh. that character's psyche. Something that makes that character scared, horrified, frightened, vulnerable. Uh, bad things happen, and then nightmares um, become more nightmarish. When this, uh, this, this creature sees one of those things, it kind of sits up and takes notice and says, okay, here's what we're going to do. And it leaks some of its acid from its, uh, you know, the corners of its eye. Okay. Uh, kind of like Sandman with sand. It leaks a little bit of the acid um, onto the, uh, the creature, the Sferf Neblin. So the Sferf Neblin, the next morning, wakes up and it's like, what the hell happened? Did I beat myself up at night? This mm. is weird. I'm waking up with weird things. And um, that, that gets a saving throw from that creature. If that creature fails a saving throw, um, this, uh, this critter gets to insert itself now. It goes from monitoring dreams to inserting itself into dreams and being able to manipulate them along the way. And it starts crafting dreams and pulling characters and bits of subconscious around to try to get that trauma to come the fuck out. Oh. And then nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. If you have enough nightmares, you start like somnambulating. You start sleepwalking. Mm -hmm. You start having night terrors. You start getting sleep paralysis. You know, things happen to you in the physical waking world as a manifestation of what's going on to you in the dreams. And this guy is like pushing you and pushing you and pushing you and feeding the nightmares, trying to get that core trauma to just magnify to epic proportions. And when it when it reaches sort of like that dream critical mass mm -hmm. and it realizes this is it, this is what I need. It changes its plans and it encounters that creature in the waking world. And then it says, you're my bitch now. It comes up on him. It grabs him with its tentacles. Oh, it God. grapples him. And then it tries to pull him into the, uh, the pupils. Oh, the, God. I don't know if you know this about people and pupils, but like uh, emotions like love and hate, they cause your pupils to contract and restrict. And uh, when you, I, I believe it's hate will cause your, uh, your pupils to constrict all the more. So imagine this thing is just hating, 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 hating. 
and its pupils go slam, 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 slam down, oh. causing more and more damage. And then you, you get to sort of like a weakened state, like a spider envenoming its prey. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of holds you out. And this is where things get awesome because there's a specific spell that this guy has at level six, but I weakened it for the purpose of this monster. Right. Where it summons a dream creature that takes on the manifestation of your fucking trauma of the nightmares you've been having for the past month. And this thing walks out of the pupil of this monster. Comes out of the pupil, comes out of the pupil. And you're sitting here being grappled and held and you're looking into the abyss and then your nightmare is walking out of the abyss towards you. Got it. And then it flanks you because once it's summoned, it gets to pick a square. Right. And, uh, and so okay. you've got like, you've got your nightmare behind you. Right. And he kind of does whatever he's going to do, your nightmare. And then combat ensues. Long story short, um, if you get reduced to zero hit points, mm-hmm. you know, you're subdued, you're unconscious, you might be dead, whatever. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't kill you. It drags you back to the dreamlands and it goes from subsistence grazing kind of a living to, uh, it can feed off of that power trauma for a year. Oh, wow. And it doesn't have to come back and hunt for a solid year. It goes yeah. back home and it's like, Hibernates. I got mine. It's like a Viking bringing yeah. its, uh, its ill-gotten gains back to the Oh end. my gosh. So this, this creature lives in the dreamlands. That's where it is. Okay. And then it comes out to hunt in the darklands in civilized areas with shorter creatures because this is a four square large creature mm-hmm. and it doesn't want to mess with people who can fight back and wrestle. Mm-hmm. So it does that. It uh, monitors your dreams and then it enters your dreams, manipulates things, causes your traumas to blow up. Remember, this is levels one through five is what I built this for. And you can build this creature at level 10 to account for level five through 10 and then 10 through 15. There can be five different versions of this creature escalating in power to get to the ultimate, you know, dream uh, campaign. And uh, it causes your traumas to manifest. You can't sleep anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, you're, uh, you're fatigued because you can't sleep anymore. All kinds of conditions and effects. And then it gets you to the point where it's like, okay, you're really tasty now. It summons that manifestation of your butters nightmares. Butters you up. It eats the crap butters out of you. you up and then it... And then drags you back to, Takes you know, to home. eat you over the next year. That's wild. In the dreamlands. All right. So how does that lead to stats? Uh, <laughs> very carefully. <laughs> All right. All right. Because like, that was my original question. And you're like, yeah, yeah let me tell you a little bit. A little bit yeah. About something. So I, I, the stats don't make sense without that. So he's yeah, level absolutely. five. We already established that. Okay. Um, he's a night glare. That's his name. Neutral evil. He's large. I picked the tags, apparition, dream, and uh, the ability to have dark vision because mm-hmm. under dark. I didn't want to go crazy with the tags yet. So this is a first draft beastie. So um, you built, you decided to pick tags and traits. So getting back I did, to the I did way the top down. Yeah. Getting back to the way the book works, mm-hmm. it literally lists. It has a very specific order with which you are supposed to pick things. Yes. And the first thing it asks you to pick is the level of the creature. Yeah. I so picked seven. It didn't work for me, okay. so I scaled it back to five. Gotcha. That was my process there. And then you picked alignment, size, and traits. Traits are the tags that you're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Got yeah. it, got it, got yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. The alignment was easy because this is, you know, the dreamlands, neutral evil is mm-hmm. kind of a thing there. Yeah. Uh, it's really, really cold. So by the time I get to immunities, I already know what I'm looking at. I know what my resistances are going to be because of where they came from. So I knew that future steps were already going to be filled in by the time I got there. Exactly. That let me breathe a little easier. Exactly. And that's getting back to the original piece of advice I had, which was the stronger your concept is, the easier it is going to sure. be to fill in the blanks. It starts to write here. itself by exactly. the time you get there. So then we jump up to ability modifiers. Yeah, ability modifiers. So this is where I uh, I was kind of lost, mm-hmm. and I, I really had to lean on the bumper bowling or rails mm-hmm. that this uh, this process provided. So it, it breaks um, modifiers and really everything in here into categories. So you have extremely good, you have high, uh, I think you have moderate, you have low, and you have terrible. These are sort of like how good or bad a modifier or ability or attack bonus you can give your critter. You can't give them all extreme. That's, that's dumb. Uh, you need to balance it out. Balance, balance, balance. So I just didn't know what the balance was. Mm-hmm. And this thing said, be careful with your highs yeah you want highs you don't want all five of your stats to be high it says stats it says one Mm -hmm. maybe two of the six stats you choose from should be high yeah and i went with two okay because i really wanted a grappler Mm -hmm. a physical athletics combat grappler yeah but i also wanted the intimidation the psychic energy 
Charisma. The uh, I'm in your mind, motherfucker, in your dreams. And, the, and I'm Freddy Krueger in here. The important part is that you balance and offset mm -hmm. those high stats with low stats. So if you go high, high, it sounds like we both went high, high. So strength charisma was my high, high. Right. Um, that means you also want to go low, low, and then you'll have two more left that you probably put at medium or moderate. Intelligence, wisdom were my low lows. Got it. I just, um, I didn't want to go heavy on the spells. Yeah. I didn't want to go with any kind of divine connection. I just, I, I didn't really need a super high initiative mm -hmm. perception. I just didn't need any of that. So for this, this is concept. a predator creature, almost animalistic. It's an opportunistic predator. An opportunistic predator. So yeah. it's almost animalistic in nature. Yeah, it's, it's obviously tricksy and false and it wants to lure you into yeah. the perfect situation where it can attack. It's, all it's not something like, where it stumbles on you. It's something where you stumble onto it. Right. It's smarter than like a human probably still. But yeah, not in a like, cunning way. Yeah, yeah not in absolutely. a book learning way or nothing yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then uh, Constitution, it's a giant eyeball with tentacles. It's an aberration. It's spongy. Uh, it's got things going on with it. I figure Constitution was a good medium stat. Yeah, moderate. Yeah, yep. And then uh, Dexterity is moderate too. Uh, Dexterity like. was low. I, I picked three low, one moderate. Oh wow. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Again, I wasn't quite sure. I think at the end of the day, it's better to err on the side of having too many lows than sure. it is to have too, too many highs. highs yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to overtune. It's hard to undertune for the most part because you know a lot of these creatures, unlike yours, you, your plan for yours is to show up. Um, multiple times and be like a big uh, antagonist to yeah, the player. Yeah, recurring but most problem. of the monsters that we make, that you're going to make, are going to be kind of flashes in the pan. Mm -hmm. They're going to be introduced to the players once, maybe two or three times. And they're going to have immediate effects that take place in exactly. that session. Exactly. So those immediate effects need to be apparent. Yeah. So it's okay for them to have a bad stat, especially when it never comes up in the entire game. And strength and charisma is just really easy to let loose on the table and get some immediate, fun, interactive um, effects that are positive for players. Sweet. So strength and charisma and constitution, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the physical stuff with, uh, you know, Cha. And what's interesting is the book lets you know that once you've picked these stats, mm -hmm. that really begins leading you in all the other directions you need to go. Sure. So when it comes, the next step is perception and senses. Yeah. Well, obviously, if they had a strong wisdom, they should probably have a strong perception to match it. Yes. And in addition to that, I think it also said in there, if you're in doubt on the perception, mm -hmm. it's not going to break anything. Just make it high. Just err yeah. on the side of high. Yeah. Don't do it if all you're looking to do is win at initiative. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in doubt, it's, it's not going to hurt anything if you it's just go high on not the, the worst case scenario. Um, and in this case, yours was low, right? Your wisdom's low. My wisdom was low and I went with high perception. Really? Yeah. So the, um, I didn't I mean, have- it is a giant eyeball. <laughs> After all, it is a giant eyeball. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, uh, we'll that get into sense. the juicy parts on that later. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, the idea, I, I didn't have a picture I was working from. Right. Like you did. I didn't work backwards from an image, but I had an image in my mind once I figured I, under dark, a lot of it's invisible. Some of it's not invisible. What parts aren't? Oh, black on black. Mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of this stuff going on. And the image in my head is a stone doorway in the Underdark. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's the black pupil. And you can't see anything else. And you walk right into that son of a bitch. And it's like, it, it needed to have the perception to stage an ambush. That, that's kind of how I justify that in my, in, my, in my mind. It wasn't an intelligence-based or a wisdom-based sort of thing. It was like cunning and crafty. and situational with just enough forethought mm -hmm. because it understands it understands the function of doorways it understands the function of thresholds it's a creature of dream thresholds are its bread and butter that's where it eats right, right. dream itself is a threshold <laughs> that's where it so, eats uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah i like it when you get my jokes before i do yeah so uh that that was my personal justification justification of having intelligence and wisdom be low gotcha. but the perception high that makes sense so what kind of senses does it have then I'd, I just gave it dark vision. Uh, okay. What else did I give it? Um, it telepathy, 30 feet, and tongues. Mm. So it can, in, uh, it can speak with anybody. Got it. Dreams. Again, it needs sense. to be able to communicate. Absolutely. And it comes from an alien world. It didn't make sense to give it undercommon or aklo mm -hmm. or any of the, uh, the actual languages of Galarian or a prime material languages. Yeah, yeah. language. So it, it didn't feel like it was going to numerically break anything to just give it tongues. Gotcha. And I saw examples of that. And um, dream-based creatures with dream tags elsewhere in the best cherries. I just stole it. That's it. okay. Now we're getting into the nitty-gritty here, which is 
stealing from the fucking beast. Steal series. shamelessly. Because uh, for a lot of my choices, I was just like, what do other seventh level yep. humanoid creatures with wings have? Sure. Let's see. At this here. stage, that's what you do. That's exactly. a smart move. Exactly. So that's really interesting. You you found other examples of dream creatures? I needed to. I wasn't sure how they were handling the physical versus the mental and all that other crap. Right. And that's great because it actually keeps the monster consistent yes. along with everything else that in, in the game space. So if yeah. you wanted to, you could drop this monster into a regular Pathfinder. I mean, you're planning on dropping it into a, a Galorian game. So it matches any other dream creatures that you could also throw into a Galorian game. Mm -hmm. I bet your players wouldn't even tell given the right amount of uh, comparison against other dream creatures that you made this monster up in the first place. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, there's no way for them to, unless they've memorized every monster in the bestiary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and most of us have never done that. Most of us. <laughs> you are a diamond in the rough. I, I didn't do it for Pathfinder second edition, but I was notorious for doing it for uh 3.5. <laughs> yeah. It was bad. Yeah. I was a young lad. We had to pay significantly to less rent back then. Didn't yeah. We? Yeah. I had, I had, I had, I was a young man with literally nothing to do and a, <laughs> a, a part-time job burning a hole in my pocket. So sweet. So, um, we, so telepathy, uh, 30 feet and tongues. Mm -hmm. I picked 30 feet instead of the usual 60 or 120. Right. Because I wanted this creature to be an up close kind of mm -hmm. guy. Gotcha. He can't sit too far away and do his things. Mm -hmm. He needs to have a little skin in the game, so to speak. And he's got to get within like a, like almost within a one action stride of, of a player character. So there's risk involved. In gotcha. That's I, why, did that's something, why I, I did something similar for mine as well in some ways. Um, but we'll get to mine after we finish your stats. Okay, we're going to go so, all the way through mine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. let's jump into your skills. Skills. How did you pick your skills? This was a weird one for me because I didn't get any guidance from that book on how many skills I should do. I will say that's probably the one part that was very lacking. I was at first tempted to pick every single skill. Why wouldn't you? And just decide which ones are which. Right. But when we look at the bestiary, we see that a lot of monsters only have five or six skills. that they Yeah, have between three and for. seven is what I was noticing between exactly. five and seven level monsters. And I think what that's trying to imply these are the things that they're quote unquote trained in. Right. 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 They have a minimum amount of training in these things. Mm -hmm. Everything else you just deduce based off of untrained plus their stat. Right. Their Circumstance modifier. bonus and crap yeah, like exactly, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which by the time you get up in levels is nothing. Me. Yeah, absolutely. So what did I pick? Um, athletics because I needed the grapple. Gotta have it. Um, uh, stealth because we're staging an ambush. That just creature. makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. Especially in the Underdark. Uh, intimidation. Mm -hmm. Once I have you in the grapple, I want to be able to do intimidation things. The fear component? The, the fear component, right. Mm -hmm. This is Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street territory. I want you to be freaking the fuck out when your nightmare walks through my uh, my pupil directly at you and starts right. interacting with you. Uh, just escalate, escalate, escalate. So um, athletic, stealth, intimidation for the reasons I mentioned. I pick lore dreams. Mm -hmm. I love the lore skill, it's and funny. I think it's drastically underused. Oh my god, I picked a lore too. Yeah. I picked a lore too, and my lore, you know, my creatures are watchers over a specific town. They mm -hmm. literally have extreme skill or whatever in the lore. In the uh, uh, they have extreme lore skill of the town they watch over. Sure, in that they know everything there is to know because that's literally their job, mm -hmm. and that's all they do. They yeah. stand as sentinels. Yeah, lore is one of those skills where. Unless you're playing a lore based character like a lore master or a bard or something like that, maybe a wizard, mm -hmm. um, you're you're not going to see a ton of fighters with a lore skill because it feels like a waste of a skill. You get and one, I hate that you get I'm, one at first level or whatever because of your background and that's the only lore you'll ever have. Yeah, which you know, fine, I guess, but I almost want to say like. I want to have special Easter eggs reserved for people who bother to pay mm -hmm. to have a lore on their character sheet when they could have spent it somewhere on like athletics or acrobatics. And I know we're getting useful. kind of off topic here, but like it's important to communicate that as a GM to your players. Such to be like, real. hey guys, yep. if you pick a lore, I'm going to, it's, you're going to get a back rub. You're going to get a back rub. Even in what's important to probably stress is like the background lore you pick, mm -hmm. will get a back rub. The regular, the additional when you pay you for pick. exactly yeah. the additional lawyers you pay you, you pick also get back. Yeah, you get foot rub at that point. <laughs> yeah. So what did exactly. I pick? I pick lore dreams because right. I thought that Makes just made sense. sense. Yeah, I, totally. I originally was going to go with like um, lore uh, something aberrational mm -hmm. or Cthulhu like, yeah. and I thought nah. let's just keep it dreams. Dreams, yeah. dreams. 
And then uh, for my final one, I picked a cult because I wasn't sure if I was going to want to build special abilities later mm. or craft a unique spell for this thing that would rely on the occult numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just wasn't sure. So I sort of created that that extra skill occult plus 12 um, to be sort of like a, a, a future proofing my options. Gotcha. Um, going forward then, it says items if necessary. If necessary. That to me is important because yeah. for a creature like yours, we were talking about this before the episode started uh, online and it was like for a creature like yours and frankly for a creature like mine, they're not going to be carrying items. Sure, unless maybe your, uh, you know, Reaper type characters right. have a small scythe that they use mm-hmm. as a Swiss Army knife or something. That's like a, a badge or a sign of their station, their function, that sort of thing. Yeah, the photo but- has these two <clears throat> metal uh, stars that basically hang off of these long wrappings that make up their body. And I, I had an idea for an item where basically they could give them as bracelet presents, mm-hmm. protector of presents. And that would ab- allow them the ability to find that specific person wherever they go. But at the end of the day, I didn't want to overcomplicate my build. So sure. I just left it blank. Yeah. For this one, my um, and there's a chart on here that recommends how powerful an item you give your monster based on the level that they are. Yep. Uh, so that it doesn't break anything. And I think that's really useful. That was to, so to point useful. Out. Yeah. That's the only way I could have done that. Otherwise, yeah. I would have left it blank. Exactly. But my thought for this item, uh, I couldn't quite figure out how to make it work. But I thought maybe... what. What if I had like the weeping tear ducts mm-hmm. in, in this giant eyeball uh, secrete acid and that's the acid they use to infiltrate your dreams? Oh, so what if it was just sort of like a uh, like a self-replicating uh, bit of acid you could use to manipulate somebody's dreaming state and it just sort of regenerates every day, almost like a uh, like a Gardens of Wonder from. Yeah, yeah, Vaults. yeah. Or you could just take it a step more classic mm-hmm. and just make it one of those poison sacks. Sure. That you have to roll a yeah. survival check to get. That's an item yeah. because it's a it's a poison, right? So yeah, I, I didn't want to leave poison. that blank because I felt that was, I felt that was a, not a not cheap or a cop out, but a missed opportunity. Right. Like this is a unique monster uh, for for me. I've never right. built something like this, so why not? How how would you make an item out of this? Uh, the, the the guys over at uh, Roll for Combat they have their Battle Zoo Best Sherry where you actually strip monsters for parts. And you craft things out of them. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where my brain went when I thought of what is an item for these guys got to have. It, got it's got it's it. their tear ducts. That's the item. And then it secretes this acid that lets you manipulate their dreams or enter dream states and stuff like that. Which, again, you can use to create storylines mm-hmm. specific yeah, to absolutely. that character and other characters as well. And they have a trophy to walk around with and show that you're a killer of one of these things. Yeah, cool. or not. Or not. Just hide that yeah. shit in the deepest pocket you exactly. have and especially not tell anybody. If you've, especially if you've got trauma eaten. If you've got your, if you've got your mind yeah. If you tell me you trauma. have something in your possession that's going to fuck with my dreams, I'm not taking yeah. the bottom bunk. So the next three are very interrelated. AC, saving throws, and hit points. In many, uh, and then immunities, weaknesses, and resistances. Again, that's also very closely tied together with these three other sure. um, items. So let's talk about how you tackled AC, saving throws, hit points, immunities, weaknesses, and resistances. I didn't want to be cheesy and just pick high in everything. So I try to be really careful <laughs> yeah, of that. That's good. That's good. Uh, so and what the did book I do? warns against it. It specifically says. It does, but it doesn't say why or wh- what that threshold is. Well, it says, you know, if you, if you have a high AC, give someone a lower HP. It does, yeah. If you have a lower HP, give someone a higher AC. If you have um, a high AC and high saves, maybe give them some weaknesses to okay. get on top of the low HP to get to counteract that, you know? So in that it's a balancing act. No, I, I did a high armor class and I think I did moderate hit points. Gotcha. And the reason why I decided to go moderate on hit points was because I have a grappler with a fly speed. Mm. So if I can grapple you, I can fly to the top of a cavern and get you away from the other player characters who don't have fly because they're not seventh level yet. Mm. And it's, it's a way to sort of manipulate the, uh, the terrain in a way that's not going to be unduly punitive because we're in the underdark and it's not like you can go up 30,000 feet into the air and then drop somebody to their death. Mm -hmm. You know, caverns have ceilings, caves have ceilings, hallways have ceilings. So I, I, I tried to be fair about this while still, stretching things a bit yeah so high ac and moderate hit points is what is we what haven't gotten to speed yet but you did so you did a no-no that the book doesn't recommend which is I figured 
give um give monsters fly before the PCs have access to it. Right, right. Which is the the, the threshold for that is like seventh level or whatever. Yeah, and and I made sure to put like a little asterisk in my brain on that. Yeah. Just make it situational. If you're going to do fly. You can't put them above ground. Yeah. You know, give them some. They can only go up so high. Not at that level. Uh, Later that levels level. that they can do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. Um, or 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 do it if you want to be punishing to your players. Sure. That that could be a thing. Well, tell but, me about the saving throws. Uh, saving throws. Let's see. Fortitude twelve. Reflex nine. Will fifteen. What does that mean? Uh, will was high. Fortitude was moderate and reflex was low. And they recommended if you don't know what to do with the saves, just put put one one at each category. One of each, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And again, I didn't want to be cheesy and I figured the uh the acrobatics reflex mm-hmm. thing uh is it's not really a thing with my creature. It's a giant even though I'm trained in stealth. And I I kind of liked that a lot. Yeah, but it's a giant eyeball. It's, it's a giant probably eyeball. a giant clumsy eyeball when it's not yeah. ready to pounce on something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I felt comfortable with that. And I, I picked Will. Mm-hmm. Um because most of the monsters As in the, the beast theory have fortitude saves up the wazoo. Okay. And that, that that's the one that's typically tough. But I've got a dream predator here. Okay, so the will, will is the high one. Will is the high one. Uh, yeah, did I gotcha. say something else? No, 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 I'm just yes. confirming. Yeah, yeah will, will is high, mm-hmm. fortitude was moderate, gotcha. and then reflex is uh, I mean, fortitude, low. it's a big squishy eyeball. That kind of makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, and also mm-hmm. the crunch, crunch, crunch mm-hmm. of, the, uh, of the pupils. The- so there's... And the grappling. I, I needed to be some somewhat of a physicality right. uh, to that. There's That's an important middle. distinction here. In this monster creation stage, um, we have to keep in mind how the players are going to be interacting yes. with these monsters. When you use precious, precious actions to learn something about one of these monsters, you're oftentimes trying to learn about what their weak save is. So you can target that weak save. Yep. This is part of the, this is part of the game combat gameplay loop that is so incredibly important, especially for casters. Mm-hmm. A good caster should have one of each saving throw in their in their tool belt, and then they find out what the opponent has a weak save on, and they target that save. Right. Maybe after debuffing. I'm going to go on record themselves. right now and saying that it's the most boring part of Pathfinder Second Edition for me. But you're right. Exactly. It's it's sort of it's hard. Bake is hard coded into mm-hmm. the game. Well, that's how the they, assumption is you're leveraging that. Yeah, that's how they balance casters with yeah marshals, and that's why casters have a slower progression mm-hmm. in their attack bonuses than yeah. marshals do because they have three ACs to pick from. Boring as shit. One of for which me specifically is lower than the others. Yeah, and one of which is higher, and they need to find out which one is which. Yeah, I just I just want the GM to sort of kind of build. Push that into the narrative, and I know I've yeah, got to spend you, actions. You to don't do like it, the war game, though, man. You just don't like the war game. I, I do, but not in my not in my role play. Okay, so. okay. It is a role playing. It's, it's an Eric thing, after all. Yeah, right. Depending on how you spell yeah, it, exactly. It exactly. Where do you put the emphasis on the syllables? Yeah. <laughs> so, so those are my saves. My any hit immunities, points. weaknesses, or resistances? You know, I struggled with this one because again, I didn't see a lot of guidance in this mm-hmm. chapter on that, so right. I kind of had to extrapolate and just wing it. You didn't see any guidance, really? Uh, That's interesting to me because I, I might have overlooked it. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But For, what I ended yeah. up settling on was. Underdark, Dreams, okay. Concealing, Setterfuge, um, Illumination. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like something about light mm. felt like it would be a good It is a giant eyeball have. after all. I know and I've it's said a giant like five eyeball, times, right? but like... No, just just keep saying it because yeah. it's relevant. You yeah. know, I wanted this to be a creepy eyeball without having it feel Cthulhu. Because mm-hmm. Cthulhu is boring to me. I'll mm-hmm. say that on the record right now as well. Ooh, maybe, maybe it's because I've been inundated with it for fucking ever. But um, I'm more excited about Beholders than I am Shoggoths. Uh, and I just, I can't do anything about it. Um, so I, I wanted it to, um, uh, the weakness to be that? light, a oh, weakness to light. Yeah. yeah. So every, everything we just said totally applies. It's weak to light, but I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, right. light is literally a tag. It's, it's attached to spells. It's attached to items. Mm-hmm. It's attached to weapons and armor, uh, of different types that are magic. So what does that even mean? Um, if, if there is anything that has a light, tag it will do extra damage i just this is this is a rough draft of a monster for me absolutely and this is another asterisk i need to circle back to you once Mm -hmm. i more fully understand this and sort of just like talk to people and say hey what do you think about this and after you how can you leverage light against this yeah is it a torch Mm -hmm. is it that simple do you need to continue a light because a torch isn't light enough here's an idea at what point does it qualify um you could have a special weakness a lot of times uh in Monster stat blocks, you'll have the immunities, resistances, and weaknesses. But mm-hmm. under that, above where they would put a reaction, 
mm-hmm. and below where they would put weaknesses and immunities, they have special weaknesses to very specific things. Okay. Um, you could have an example. Uh, not, you said specific things. Like- yeah. Not off the top of my head, but okay. like uh, actually demons, they're literally weak to like you talking about sins and like indulging in your sins. So oh, everyone you're the, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so like demons every one of the demons example. have like a, every one of the demons have like a special sin tax or whatever that they have. Actually, yeah. have sin tax. Yeah. So like you can fuck with demons. That's only funny because it's beer. Yeah. So you can only fuck with demons uh, uh, by just doing bad stuff. Right. Um, right. And yeah, here it is. Uh, peace, vulnerability of rock. He's a wrath. Uh, of demon. rock's wrath. He's wrath. Demon is the heart of their essence. Enforcing peace upon them wrenches their soul. Yeah. Uh, if they fail a save against a calm emotions or similar effect, forcing them to be peaceful, a rock takes 4d6 damage. Okay, that's exactly Mentally. what I needed to hear. Yeah. So I have a dream predator, mm-hmm. but if I look to the design space within demons, I can scotch that that concept and then yeah. drop it in my, uh, and that's my new dream what I, creature. For my creature, I scotched a bunch of different inspiration from undead from demons and from devils because the yeah. like the ironies to me was the perfect example to pull a monster from even though it wasn't undead because it was a level eight creature that was a humanoid with wings sure to me that was just like all right this is a good template to start with and we'll go from there right yeah yep. so that would be another exa- example of, a, of an immunity you could do um moving on uh weaknesses and immunities i did give her uh it an immunity to cold because okay. the uh, the realm of dreams is oh, okay. preternaturally cold. Interesting. Creatures the, who come from there do In have the that? book, they recommend giving immunities to things that have an element they're made out of um, and resistances to things where they live in an environment that is cold. Yeah. So picking immunity is an interesting choice, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know if I read it there or an archive of Nethys, but somewhere it said that, uh, oh, maybe it was the Bestiary 3 when I was looking up dream creatures. Okay. Uh, Critters that come from the domain of dreams, they tend to have immunity to cold gotcha. just by default. It's just and again, go look at it's other like a fire ex- otter in the elemental plane of fire. Yeah, exactly. So, like this, this goes back to look at the other monsters. Look at examples of those who have come before with the dream tag. Yeah, and if it's common, mm-hmm. put it in your monster because it'll make them more cohesive. Yeah, and if you're looking for something like dream tags, mm-hmm. and you go to Mimic Fight Club, that really awesome app that lets me organize my monster fights. That we made combat. a video about. Uh, yeah, rumor has it. <laughs> so, like, if you select the dream tag, only the monsters with dream tags will pop up. Yeah. So it's not like you have to flip through 500 pages of Bisturi volumes. Yeah, and to, I, uh, I love Archives of Nethys. They do really good work over there. Yep. But they're, fil- they're filtering their filters and search. Something to be desired. It's so, it's very, yeah. very, once you learn how to use it, yeah. it's really, really great. Yeah, And, and it's better now than nice. it was two years ago, Absolutely. I have to say. Yeah, I Absolutely. just, I always end up clicking the wrong things. Yeah. And things just it's just the way it's happens. presented needs a little bit of fine tuning. But once I think it gets there, it's going to be super powerful. So, so after, weakness, light, immunity, three cold, more, and acid. Yeah, we got three more things yeah. to focus on here. Sure. Speed. And then, of course, those strikes. 25 feet and fly. I wanted it to be slower okay. than the party members. Okay. Um, but I it, I also had it fly so it can get out of the reach of party members, except for range combatants. Mm-hmm. So I tried to do a um, like a, a yes, yes, and no mm-hmm. as I kind of went through these options here. Again, I'm trying not to do high for everything because that's just cheesy and cheating. Speed, 25, fly, period. Kept it clean. Okay, so no walking. strikes and damage of those strikes. Three strikes. Three. Yeah. Venus tendrils. Okay. Uh, the veins in your eyes, I mentioned, I wanted them to be tendrils that can grapple with you. So what I did was I th- think I did moderate damage and high to hit. Which is what the, one, of the thing, one of the things I recommend. Yeah. Again, I try to stay within the uh, the rules on and this And you're one. playing a predator martial character. So, or not playing, you're creating a predator martial monster. Yes. And it recommends in those cases to pick one of the others to be good. Yeah. You either have like mid- uh, attack, but mm-hmm. the damage is excellent. Yeah, or you have pretty decent attack and the damage is mid. Yeah, it kind of used the barbarian as an example of like you know lower to hit, higher damage. Yep. Uh, so what I wanted was I wanted my particular monster not to just reduce you to zero hit points. That's not interesting to me. Right. I wanted it to uh to keep you occupied, keep you threatened, so that your nightmare can show up. Because summoning the nightmare to show up of your deepest darkest thing, that's a three action spell. That it needs to do. And it needs an entire fucking round to do it. So it's going to weaken you, weaken you, weaken you. It It's going to hit you because it's high on the to hit. But it's moderate on the damage. It's not low on the damage. It's enough to keep you occupied. Gotcha. And I kind of wanted that 
that pressure, that pressure, that pressure. So I picked uh, Venus, Venus tendrils plus 15, 2D6 plus 6, uh, bludgeoning plus grab. Gotcha. Um, I love that plus grab, and I'm so glad they put it in the second edition. Yeah, it's, it's a two strong. for one. It's strong. It's yeah. strong. It's every action- monk wants to flurry or blows my face. Well, guess what? I get a plus grab. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really strong action economy uh, yeah. vehicle. Yeah, that and you it have makes to be sense. Careful. It does make sense. You just have to be careful. You have to know sure. that like you're adding serious action economy to these attacks. Yeah, and again, I have a three action thing I'm building up to. Right. So I felt I was justified in doing the plus grab on this one. So that's the first thing it has. Uh, Venus tendrils. They wrap around. And, uh, and get you. Um, and, and again, the visual on this thing, you can see the, uh, the pupil. Mm-hmm. You can't see the whites of the eyes, but mm-hmm. you can see the tendrils. So the tendrils look like they're floating in space when you're finally in a well-lit room. Ooh. Um, because the whites of the eye and the iris, they're invisible. So if you cast them, um, see okay. invisibility, you see the totality of the creature. Oh. And you're like, are you a beholder? No? Got well, then it. what the hell are you? <laughs> Interesting. I didn't pick that up originally. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I explained it very well. But uh, but if you don't have that up, all you see is that that darkness uh, with these tendrils Floating kind of floating around trying to grab yeah. you. And they seem to be hovering nearby. So that's that. The second one I have is pupil constriction. Mm. They grapple you and they pull you into the pupils. And the pupils go, hate, 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 hate. And they slam on you. Again, high to hit, plus 15, moderate damage, 2d8 plus 7. So I do the Venus tendrils, 2d6 plus 6 bludgeoning, grab you. Pull you in, slam, slam, slam with the pupils for 2d8 plus 7. Um, or I can do my acid tears, which come out of the ducts mm. that are invisible, plus 15, high to hit, 2d6 plus 6, and splash damage for anybody nearby. Mm. So all of a sudden, your buddies are in trouble if they're trying to get you out of this grapple. Got it. Um, and Do those have a clause that says only while grappled? Uh, it doesn't, and I wasn't sure if I should include that. I didn't understand yeah. the the balance around that. Got it, got it. So I uh, would say because it's situational, you can make the other things more powerful, probably. Okay. Or, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Once it's situational, you could probably make the other things more powerful, or leave them the same, and it'll probably just work. So those are the three uh, attacks I have: Venus tendrils, the pupil it. constriction, and the acid. Tears. No ranged attacks. No range. Okay. No, I figured it was beastly enough yeah it really is and it's it's i really wanted this to be a uh a charismatic grappler got it to buy time for your fucked up shit to come do you in got it that's that was my concept so we already covered speed uh and strikes uh, mm-hmm. any spells does it cast yeah spells? spell dc 19 uh i think i picked moderate for that one i wasn't too mm-hmm. terribly concerned with that yeah. one i don't have any like range to hit spells but i wanted to future proof it so that i could which meant I needed to give it a uh, spell DC. Spell DC 19, uh, moderate. Spell attack bonus plus 11. I think that was also moderate. Mm-hmm. I gave it days just to have a thing to do. Um, I forget if that was one or two actions. It's probably two. It's two, yeah. And th- this is really the money shot right here. Lure Dream. It's a six level spell. Mm-hmm. This is a fifth level creature. So you shouldn't Typically, be able to that's a no no. Yeah. But it does say you can do that. Just be careful when you're doing it. So what um Lure Eric Dream- is an expert, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Lure Dream is a six level spell that allows you to summon something called an animated dream. This is a physical corporeal thing that comes out and it uh it, it fucks you up. It's like it's like a it's like a summon monster or mm-hmm. something of that nature. Uh, but it's dream and it reflects whatever your deepest, darkest bad thing is. Uh but that was too high. I went to um I went to um uh, the the monster tool that we keep talking about. Yeah. And I try to find the balance on that. How do I keep this as a moderate or severe encounter? Mm-hmm. I don't want to just like summon a giant thing and all of a sudden that's it's, literally it's an impossible cooler than encounter. the thing that it's summoned. So I used the weak template on it. Right. And right. that put us back into severe territory. Got so it, what I did here it, was I created a monster that's uh, trivial to four individuals. Mm-hmm. It's moderate for one individual mm-hmm. because this is a personal encounter thing. And it's severe to four individuals once this thing gets summoned. Oh. So this is a multi-stage encounter thing that I'm trying to craft this monster for. Uh, This is a complicated first uh, attempt, Eric. I just, I had an idea and I thought, how do I buy time so the big thing can arrive? And what does that do to the encounter map? And that's super ominous too. And it's it's a thing that, it's a capstone experience. Mm -hmm. It should be complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's a different, no. It should be complex, not complicated. It should be allowed to be complicated. It doesn't necessarily have to be, yeah. but it should be allowed to be. Yeah, and if you're going to do it, do it on a capstone experience yes. for one player because that's their moment, man. Mm-hmm. 
oh my God, we just went from something manageable to this asshole from my childhood back at the orphanage just stepped in and now he's strangling me from behind. Yeah. It's like the, when you look at like the plot of a movie, it's like, it gets, yeah. it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and yeah. worse. And then you think it gets better, but then it actually gets super worse. Yeah. And then that's the, the dark night of the soul followed by the climax. Yes, yeah. The denouement or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely before that. So all of that is my spell DC, my attack bonus and the spells I have so far. I didn't okay. want to overload my guy on spells because cool. he's physical. So getting out of build the stat block mm -hmm. territory, we have design abilities, and then it says review holistically. I think we'll cover that after we're done with the stats. Okay. That's kind of built into our little. I feel like we did, but I'm happy to revisit. Yeah, totally. Um, do you have any abilities that you wrote into here that are like special abilities or anything like that? I didn't know how to math it out, so I just gotcha. didn't. Gotcha. Um, I, totally I do fair. want it, but I don't have it yet. And you have an idea of basically how this whole thing will work. Yeah. And it's built into your attacks, it sounds like. Pretty much. That's it, because this feels very much like a, uh, like an, Fuck, it's almost like it's almost like it covers encounter. It, it counters all three modes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this thing is with you during your downtime activities because mm -hmm. it gets you at night. Yeah, it's during uh, encounter mode. It's during the one I can never Expiration remember. Expiration mode. mode. Someday, I'll get that tattooed on my eyelids. Um, <laughs> th this critter, it, it almost feels like I might want to make a special ability in one of those modes, like a downtime special I, I ability. Think, I think what you probably should do is change one of your strikes or both of okay. your strikes into special abilities. I think the, I think the, the first strike, okay. the attack grab, that's uh -huh. a regular strike. Sure. But then it has two special abilities that are cost one or two or three actions each. Okay. And one of them is munch, 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 like you talked about. Sure. And the other one is the eye poison oh, stuff. That was a special ability. Yeah. I, uh, that would be a special ability. Yeah, I incorrectly answered your question. Okay. There was a thing I wanted to do, which was uh, create a disease, mm -hmm. which I don't know how to do yet. Mm. And uh, the idea is uh, the uh, the acid tears would get on you, and then you'd make a saving throw, a fortitude saving throw. And if you failed, then that left you susceptible uh, starting that night on set 24 hours for this thing to come visit you in your dreams. Got it. So it can shift from one player character to another mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of you failing that saving throw. That's really cool. So, so yeah, these are kind of the ideas I was trying to, to um, numerically represent. Sweet. Uh, so let me talk about, I know the episode has probably gone on long enough, but yeah, we're on hour four, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm out of beer, but I'm going to jump right into my angel of death. Do my, it. My death watcher. So again, getting back to my concept, I had a pretty strong idea of what I wanted this creature to be, and that mm -hmm. informed the rest of the stuff here. Right. I'm going to read the little blurb, that paragraph that comes above the text that I kind of wrote for, for my, um, my creature, my monster here. Um, their name, their literal name is angels in quotation marks, and then parens, it's death watchers. So they are employed to watch over communities in two significant ways. Their first role is to secure and retrieve humans who have recently died, whisking them away to quote-unquote Heaven, parentheses, human souls are kept from moving on and then their bodies are brought into a processing plant on the other side of the mountains or something like that for a soul appraisal, extraction, or transcendence. Okay. Which is what they call turning into a... It's almost like a river of souls kind of quality to this. Yeah, except the river is always leading to becoming undead. Right. Or a puppet of undead. <laughs> And then the second responsibility is to protect communities from significant, quote unquote, unplanned threats. Uh, parentheses, unplanned threats include random visitations from Fae, insectoids, or other human tribes. These are the other factions I kind of have planned in here. The idea is maybe, I'm still playing around with this idea, world building again. This is a tool to build a world, to learn more about my world through creative um, exploration. Um my idea here is maybe each person's soul needs to go through trials and tribulations. And the more trials and tribulations they go through, the more powerful their soul becomes. Sure. And thus, um, the more powerful of an undead they can be transformed yeah, into. Yeah, it's a soul gym. Sure. So the idea is maybe they have this farm of humans and they have, you know, some goblin tribes over here and some troglodyte tribes over here. And they have some, you know, other monsters that they allow attack or they, they go into attacking the human settlement so they can have adventurers and the adventurers can go out and that could be my levels one through three or four. Okay. They could learn and fight normal monsters and then the wool gets pulled out of their eyes and they're like, oh fuck, something else is going on here. Mm -hmm. So their other job is to not only whisk people away that recently died to get processed, but also to protect 
from bigger and badder creatures okay. that the PCs can't handle from levels one through four. Okay. Does that make sense? Sure. So that leads me like to my- Prison wardens. Uh, exactly. That leads me to my level, level eight. Mm-hmm. Level eight seemed just strong enough so that the PCs can never harm them. And there's going to be multiple in each town, right? So the PCs could never harm them until they got significantly more powerful. Sure. And they could probably easily, um, or with some ability, um, pro- protect the settlement from unwanted threats that don't enrich the souls of the humans that they're trying to farm. Sure. Right? So level eight seemed like a good medium there, where once the players got powerful enough and they kind of had have had the wool pulled from uh, over their eyes for a couple levels, mm-hmm. if they had to, they could get in a skirmish with one of these things and really give it a run for its money. Okay. So, um, size and traits. Well, they got to be scooping up humans, right? Sure. So they need to be at least large and they're going to have, un- they're undead. They're of this undead mega, mega conglomerate society. So mm-hmm. they're going to be undead. Those are the two traits I picked. Large and undead. Trickle down deathonomics. I, d- I didn't, um, I didn't pick an alignment because we're getting rid of it. So I just didn't bother. Yeah. And alignment is a fuzzy, wuzzy thing in my <laughs> setting that I'm cooking up. Mm-hmm. So I figured it's easier for me just not to give it one. Jettison. Now. Fire yeah. it into the sun. Ability modifiers. I picked too high, too low, too moderate. Okay. For high, we've got dexterity and wisdom. Okay. They are um, lithe, perched creatures. And they're always watching the town. I feel like night gaunts from H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, they're keeping they're keeping tabs on literally everything at all times, the group of them. So they need to have a really good perception and they need to have a really good sense of the world. And they're very strong-willed because it's literally their job to look over other beings sure. effectively. And I figured because of their look on, in the photo and the fact that they're flying creatures and they're really skilled at it, um, they would have a high dexterity. I give them a low constitution and charisma. Mm-hmm. Um, they're big, ugly, faceless, void creatures. They don't have good charisma. They're not here to scare anyone. That's mm-hmm. not their... That's You're not going to find them on the cover of exactly. GQ. And when they try to talk to you telepathically, mm-hmm. you'll find out that they kind of begin to pull your soul out of your mind mm-hmm. accidentally. It's just like yep. their effect on you. Yep. Nope, 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 um, nope. Constitution, they're made of wrappings. They look hollow. And I imagine they would be kind of brittle if they kind of got hit by something and would crumple in some ways. Okay. So I gave it a low. And then for strength and intelligence, I just gave them moderate. And okay. Those are the two things I didn't pick. So they get moderate. Right. All right. Moving on, perception and senses. This part is really important to me because they're watchers. Right. Having a good perception or an extreme perception mm-hmm. is highly important. And like the book said, having an extreme perception or really high perception isn't that big of a deal. But from my perspective, it fits this monster sure. so well. If you're going to do it, do it here. Exactly. Senses, dark vision and life sense, 60 feet imprecise. Nice. They can also detect death that's happened recently within one mile. They have an imprecise sense. Uh, they have an imprecise sense that goes out one mile in all directions. Mm-hmm. They can detect when someone has died, like within okay. the hour or within the day or something like that. That's kind of what my idea is. So they can is. life sense to 60 and they can death sense or soul sense to 120? They, they, they can, they can um, life sense to 60 so they can tell whether something is living or dead as an imprecise sense, like uh-huh. hearing. And then like hearing, they can hear the moment when a life has transitioned okay. into living to dead. And God, that these is guys a must be great mile at radius. So they can, they can, be, because their whole job is to literally find bodies as soon as possible, as soon as they get dead, and whisk them away to the undead realm to get processed as soon sure. as possible. So they needed to have that, um, that ability. That, this is how the spiritual sausage is made. Exactly. Um, another one of the great things in the book on page uh, 59 is the base roadmaps. They give these roadmaps for. Uh, how to build the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was useful. I picked Skirmisher and a little bit of Soldier. So Skirmisher says high dex, low fortitude, high reflex, and higher speed than typical. I was like, perfect. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, Magical Striker was mine. Yeah, and that's exactly. Magical Striker was yours. So that's kind of like the... the, I I use that framework. I love frameworks. Look at it. I love frameworks. And this is the framework that really helped me pick some of these other details. Especially for a first, uh, first draft. Exactly, exactly. Languages, super important. 
Um, they don't speak, but they can communicate telepathically mm-hmm. with creatures, but especially with each other. Okay. So a lot of times if there's one, if one knows something, the others need to know, they'll fly over to them and let them know telepathically. One will just land on a building mm-hmm. across the street from another building and they won't even look at each other, but they'll be talking. What's and the range? Relaying 100 feet. 100 feet, okay. So they'll be relaying information. The reason I chose that specifically is because the demons and devils have telepathy at 100 feet. And they were oh, uh, that was eighth, easy. eighth level yeah. creatures. So I was like, done. Easy okay. peasy lemon squeezy. Moving on. Um, languages, telepathy, dreams. I just put dreams. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be cool if maybe they could implant dreams into the minds of the villagers that they're looking over. Um, I haven't decided yet if they're the sh- if they're the sheep herders or if they're just the the people who whisk the the sheep away to the processing plant. Maybe there's another creature that I can create that's actively cultivating heroism or cultivating strong souls to be reaped later. I don't know. Okay. So I just put dreams as a communicative device there. I might get rid of it later. Um, and then dark vision. It's mine. You can't have it. They gotta have dark vision. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So skills. Um. Again, I looked back at one of these creatures and I was just like, what skills do they have? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll just go off of that. Um, I didn't really, I couldn't really think of any. Did you pick the Irenes for this one? Yeah, the Irenes. Um, the skills the Irenes has is acrobatics, crafting, deception, diplomacy, intimidation, religion, and stealth. So I kind of copped a couple of those and then picked a couple different ones. I went with acrobatics as high. They're a flyer. They're a very adept sure, flyer. They need to have strong acrobatics. Athletics as medium low, a moderate low at plus 15. It's an eighth mm-hmm. level monster. Acrobatics is plus 18 for those who care. Diplomacy, very low, plus 12. Um, they're ugly, sinister creatures that aren't meant to communicate with normal beings. Sure. Um, they have a very low diplomacy. I put diplomacy there because I knew they could communicate if they had to. Mm-hmm. And the tables we run in, they always want to talk to everything, right? <laughs> So if I'm ever making a monster for any of my tables and it's not mindless, it's, they're going to get a diplomacy score just so I can look at the monster and know how shit, like how this is going to fare yeah. because I know it's going to come up, yeah. right? I know it's going to building come up. your players at this I'm point. building my players at this point. Exactly. Um, religion, because that's the magic that they cast. Also they're undead. That's sure. what the things fall into. Even though I'm creating my own custom setting, I wanted to make sure that the typical assumptions that the game has about where things lie still gets upheld. So sure. religion is what you would use for uh, knowing about undead things, but mm-hmm. I can twist what religion means. You know, I can twist the definition of that skill mm-hmm. without changing what that skill actually does. Yeah. As long as it doesn't overlap with something else. Exactly. Exactly. And then uh, stealth, I gave it eight plus 18 as high. They're giant creatures that often don't hide themselves, but sometimes they have to. And when they do, they can do it very well. Why? Well, they have a high dexterity. Mm-hmm. So it only makes sense that they'd be good at stealth, right? And I went with that. Um, and then finally, I gave them a lore, like I talked about previously, plus 21 extreme mm-hmm. lore city they watch over. These okay. creatures know their city mm-hmm. like no one else. They've, they've they been there. All the public restrooms. <laughs> exactly. They, they know everything there is to know. They're constantly reading the minds of people that walk by just mm-hmm. to kind of glimmer little ideas from what's going on underneath. Um, so I thought it was only appropriate to give them that lore. Whether or not it'll ever come up in a game, probably not. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Um, but if it does, could build around it. I could build around it. Yeah. But if it does, I have it right there in front of me. Items, none. none. I just didn't bother. Like I guess okay. I talked about earlier, they have little rings in the picture. I thought it might have been a cool idea, but you know, I was like, and there's no reason you can't circle back to it exactly. Later. And I just, I, I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew here. Sure. So I just left it as is and kept walking. Rubber is hitting the road here when it comes to monster creation. If you get these guys in combat, what do they look like? High AC. Um, uh, their will save is moderate at plus 16. Reflex is high at 19. They have good dexterity. They already had a moderate will save already. Okay. So I gave them uh, a moderate. Um, they had a moderate wisdom, so I gave them a moderate will save. And then they had a low constitution, maybe, I think. Um, so I gave them a low uh, fortitude save. When I look at them, they're a bag of, uh, they're a bag of of sh- pieces of fabric, you know, like of uh, wrappings, kind of mm-hmm. like fluttering in the wind. But some, there's something inside of there that's giving those flutterings form. So I figured a low fortitude save was um, 
representative of the picture. You know, okay. I mean? I'm going off the picture here. That's what's kind of informing all these decisions. Um, moving forward, HP, you'll see if you go into the doobly doo, I've got um, my stat block with all my little notes written for everyone to pick up. And so will Eric. So you can follow along and look at these monsters as we go over them. I tried to write little notes about like where things came from and whether or not they're moderate or high. For HP, I chose a base HP of moderate to low, 123, mm -hmm. because I like the numbers. And it was somewhere between moderate and low. I didn't want them to be moderate HP because they had a high AC. Right. And they're going to have a bunch of immunities and stuff. So I gave them a moderate to low to start with. Right. When you hit them, you need to make a count. Exactly. And then I chose uh, resistances. They have undead traits, right? So they sure. have a bunch of they have a bunch of immunities and stuff um, to a bunch of different things. And when I look at them, it looks like they would be kind of immune to bludgeoning effects okay. because they're made of these paper and there's like this emanation coming from within them. So if you hit them with like a... Um, a lot of give? Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of give. They would just... Oh, there's a lot of give. Right. And it would just eat any kind of bludgeoning damage. Sure. I wanted to give them resistance. So I, I did resistance five bludgeoning. And the book tells you if you give something a resistance and it's um, like if it's specific, you quadruple the number in HP or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I gave them an extra 20 because of their, um, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I misspoke here. I gave them a weakness to positive energy. Okay. Makes sense. That's a very specific weakness. And because of that, I gave them extra HP. Yeah. I give them twice as much HP, but then because of their resistance to bludgeoning damage, um, and their other immunities, I gave them negative 30 HP. So basically, they're down a net 10 HP. Okay. So I kind of started with the base. Resistances and immunities lowered it, and then their weaknesses made Up it bit. higher to an amount, and we, it came out to a final total, which was 113 HP. Okay. All right. And this chapter outlines how to do that in an yeah. easy, streamlined way, so it's not complicated. Exactly, exactly. I was using what the book said as a reference point and then jumping off yeah, from there. No extrapolation. It's, yeah. it's there. It's all there. Um, <clears throat> all their immunities and stuff like that. Here we go. Nitty gritty combat speeds. So I give them, a, they're a normal large size humanoid. I give them a 25 foot movement speed on the ground. And then because they're a skirmisher, remember I used the skirmisher right. uh, uh, framework. I give them a fast fly speed at 40 feet. Okay. And this was corroborated by the fact that the Irenes, also an eighth level creature, the one I'm basing it off of, also has a 40 foot Gotta catch movement those speed. Gotta catch those monks. Exactly. So 40 foot movement speed. These things are perching at the top of buildings. By eighth level, your player should be able to deal with flying. If they can't, this will be a rude awakening. So here we are. 40 foot flying speed. Swooping shrikes. Exactly. And they swoop down and they, the, the image I have in their mind is that these big, beautiful wings, these feathered wings like angels. Um, so when uh, someone dies, it's customary to immediately close their eyes, put something over their head, and drag the body out into the open so the angels can come and take them away. Leave your dead in the streets. Exactly, <laughs> because the angels will come immediately and take right. them away. You don't want an angel coming into your house mm -hmm. and knocking things over just to grab your, your uh, dead partner. Mm -hmm. They will wait for a few moments for you to bring them out to them. And I imagine they, they hover over them, they crouch over them, and their wings kind of create a, a whole circle around them so that no one can see inside. Their wings are kind of completely covering them as they crouch over this person. And that's when they cast a spell. I'm jumping around here, but they cast um, a gentle repose. Mm -hmm. So they create a static dead body that won't age as soon as possible. And then they, then they whisk them away to, to, to heaven, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I also gave them ant hall as a spell <laughs> because I figured, you know, if some of these more portly humans, they need right. to drag away. Maybe I gave them a, a not the best strength. Chunky monks. So uh, Aunt Hall couldn't hurt. And I kind of imagine them also maybe being used as like shepherds because they're already, they're already kind of couriers of sorts. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine in other parts of the world, they're also used as just like couriers sure. who just like move giant things and they fly around doing that. I don't know. Um, but getting back to the, the 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 regularly scheduled lineup here, <laughs> um, uh, we've got speed, uh, the the fly speed, and then go strikes and damage. So 
I was really torn here. I wanted to give them a ranged attack, mm -hmm. but I also knew I wanted to give them some cool special abilities that kind of reminded me of death from Diablo three or the mm -hmm. Diablo franchise, because that's kind of what they reminded me of with the hood and the black face or the, the no face, just black nothingness. So I gave them just a melee attack, just a claws attack. They have these huge talons, right? And to make it interesting, just like the Irenes, instead of giving them um, 2d8 plus 9 damage with their claw attacks, I gave them 1d8 plus 8, and then 2d6 um, negative damage because okay. they're undead and they're, they're just oozing with this necrotic, like, Ability. Bad touch. Bad touch. Exactly. 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 And I figured if if you're, they're, they fly so fast that they always just get into melee range. They're yeah. all about being in your face. So if someone's hitting them from afar, they just move twice, move 80 feet and strike you. Mm -hmm. Easy. So they're just a melee striker for the most part, except for their, for their special abilities. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what you've been waiting for. So I'll say right up front, both of these abilities were stripped directly from monsters. Okay. All right. The first one was taken from the Scaveling, which is a random undead monster at level eight I found. And then, no, sorry, I think it's a level five monster. Um, and then I took the other ability from the Bodak. If, if you're familiar with what a, I've never even, I never I've heard them. I haven't read. The yeah. I, I, no, I never read the entries until now either. So the Scaveling has a, Scream attack, a screech attack. Okay, like a this, sonic thing? Yeah, this is a one-two punch. The way I have it thought out. In the book, it recommends that you that you don't generally have a three-action attack because oftentimes you use all three actions to do your thing. And in the course of a fight, a monster won't have the ability to do this mm -hmm. because they'll be trying to close the gap or sure. something like that. So they recommend if you have a three-action um, ability, it should be a gap closer plus an attack or something like that. I decided to take a three action ability and split it up into one actions and two actions. Okay. And that way, if it can chain them together, it's a cool wombo combo. Mm -hmm. And if not, at least you get something, at least you get something. So, if, so first what they do is they scream their soul shattering screech. The angels of death, I'm sorry, the angels or the death watchers unleash a horrifying screech that chills the very souls of those close enough to feel it. The screech can be heard for miles, but the screech, but each creature within 30 feet, and I increased that from the original monster because it was a level five monster, and I wanted the mm -hmm. range of this ability to line up with the other, the range of the other ability. Okay. So I increased it to 30 feet. 30 foot emanation, DC 27 will save. I increased the DC to match its level. Um, then, then they can't use this ability for 1d4 more rounds. Basically, they give the frightened condition. That's important. It's a debuff. Mm -hmm. Frightened one or frightened two on a failure. Critical failure, the frightened two, and stunned one. Then the Bodak. Taken from the Bodak, death gaze. Two actions. So I had a one action screech, two action death gaze. I imagine they 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 look at you with their black nothingness head, and slowly but surely your soul begins to uh fly, leech out of your eyes and mouth and ears, and they just consume your soul as they gaze deeply into your, into the, as you de gaze deeply into the abyss. Um, it's something nope, they nope, don't nope. want to do. They're not here to harvest souls like this. Mm -hmm. The, your soul, when they have to do this, your soul is, um, it's not ripe yet, okay. but they have to do this. If they're trying to kill an enemy that's coming into the town, or maybe there's an upstart hero who got a little too powerful from their last adventure. They need to be ended now. So, Basically, the way this works, they stare at a living creature within 30 feet um, that can sense them with its life sense. Again, the Bodak has written all this in. All I did was replace the name of Bodak with yep. the name of the creature and made sure the DCs lined up. That creature must attempt a DC 26 fortitude save. 26 is lower than the other DC. Okay. I did this specifically because the other one is a debuff. So it's actually like a 27 if they fail. It's a 28 if they critically fail the debuff. So I kind of balanced it so that if they failed, it would still be within lined up just about with a normal, okay. uh, moderate uh, save sure. or whatever. Um, long story short, um, they gained the drained. Um, oh, is it really that boring? Is my monster that boring? No, no. I'm a hammer just, into your I'm head. Listening. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, if you fail, you get the drain condition and they heal HP. Okay. So that's the, a fan of that. that's the monster. Okay. They... 
they, they have a purpose. They're kind of a set piece, but if you interact with them in any significant way mm -hmm. and attack them, they just rake you apart and drain your soul. They, they, they bite into the unripened fruit that is your soul mm -hmm. and take it um, sooner than it should. Uh, but it's what they had to do in order to keep the peace and protect the rest of their livestock, okay. which were the humans. So that's my monster mechanically and your monster mechanically. Getting back to our kind of outline for the episode, we have one more step. So you've come up with your idea. You've put stats to it. You got an art, all that jazz. It says, the book set suggests that you look at um, the monster design holistically. Does the abilities and stats line up and reinforce the ideas that your monster is supposed to propose? Yep. What I wrote in my episode outline here is how to implement. This is the step after that. How are you going to sew this monster into the fabric of your game, Eric? I feel like we already talked about that for both of ours. We kind of did, but Go I think it's yours. important to reiterate it here. Okay. Your monster's sole purpose. Remember, we're getting back to step two. The purpose of the monster is to influence a specific player, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the way you're going to do that is by sewing, it, sewing this monster into the story. Yeah, I actually have a paragraph here. I can read it out loud. Do it. Do All it. Right. I love it. <clears throat> monologue, monologue, la, 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 monologue, la, la, la. monologue, 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 monologue. How to implement or sew it into the fabric of the game. Dream sequences with PC digging into character fears over the course of levels one to five. Keep digging as a GM until the player finally gives you something actionable to work with. If it doesn't happen by level five, then scrap the storyline. Or you could remove the player's agency and just give that character a fear. Or you can have a mid-campaign pause, do a session zero to discuss what the fuck we're actually doing here, mm -hmm. and then make decisions going forward. So um, my particular beastie requires a degree of player buy-in that yours might not. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that sounds fair. Yeah, okay. And I think there are fair, neutral, and unfair ways to get that buy-in. Absolutely. <laughs> All the tools are on the table. You can start pulling teeth. Yeah. Using the hammer. But um, in, in my experience, players are um, usually really cool to roll with punches and go, oh, you're paying attention to me. Yeah, yeah sure. Hurt me. Do whatever. You know, just uh, tell me what you need. Yeah. And other players are a lot more precious with your characters. Mm -hmm. And they're like, run everything by me first. And I want this in triplicate. Uh, don't use this monster with those players. <laughs> Get your player buy-in. There's a there's a scalpel or as a tool for every problem. Uh -huh. Not everything requires a hammer. I can I can do everything in my life with that tool right there. That's true. All That's true. It. If you try All hard enough. It. Yeah. It's so Swiss Army hammer. What's in, what's interesting? What I'm hearing from you is that this is a monster that works well with specific kinds of players. Sure. And not that great with other ones. Yeah. And you need to be cogent of that and sew this monster into the storylines of players you know or think are going to really enjoy this or know yes. by asking them. If, if, if you want to get what I, I believe is the full experience, right. you can get a partial experience just like anything else. You could just throw this thing into a, you can, into you a just throw it in there. It could, you know, your character had yeah. a bad dream a week ago and this guy showed up a week later. Dumb, we do dumb, it with dumb. night hags. We do it with all manner of other beasties that interact with dreams. Exactly. But if you want to milk this thing for the purpose for which it was intended, this is a long con kind of monster. Mm. This is a seeding. This is a, uh, a foreshadowing kind of thing. Building up the dread, exposing the dread, amplifying the dread, and then consuming your dread mm. as I drag you back to my crazy ass planar existence right. and eat you for the next year. So um, all of that is definitely... It's it's not for every table, for sure. Mm -hmm. But if you just want to use it as a monster of the week, it's got stats. It's got attacks. It's got vulnerabilities, weaknesses, immunities. Um, it can be it can be usable by beginning GMs, intermediate GMs, advanced GMs. Um, or you can just strip it for parts yeah. and make your own monster out of it. Absolutely. The way I would sew mine into the story of a campaign of my homebrew setting mm -hmm. is pretty straightforward because it's a set piece. Right. They exist and that you always describe them offhandedly as, as the angels. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're just, you do, your players walk outside of the They're tavern. almost like gargoyles on the top of church exactly. buildings. Exactly. That's what I had in mind. They, they, you walk out and there they are, the angels just sitting atop a building, you know, waiting for any mm -hmm. dead soul, blah, blah, blah. And one day maybe 
one of your one of the player's friends dies mm -hmm. and they're heartbroken and they don't want to give the body up and that creates a confrontation between the angel and the player and now i need the stats yeah. or maybe the players during one of their escapades strengthening their souls as was planned mm -hmm. discover a piece of information that begins to pull the wool over their out from over their eyes or however the saying goes. And they begin looking at these angels in a different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe they challenge one to a verbal debate or begin asking a question to begin mocking it or begin poking the bear in some way. And now I need to exercise just a part of this stat block. Or maybe the players uh, tra adventure a little too far to the mm -hmm. edge of the farm. And uh, just like that famous, um, What's that famous movie with the red hoods and the pig men who ends up being like a the village, the village, just like the village where they actually live in a gated community sure. and they find out about the end. Um, the humans and their get to the edge of their pen and they begin running up against some of the other factions they've never even heard of or heard were complete monsters and aren't something like that. They get a new piece of information mm -hmm. or maybe those other people attack them. And now out of nowhere, the angels swoop in and save the party. But the party sees a side of these angels that they never saw before. Mm -hmm. They saw them draining the souls. Yep. They hear the chitterous um, mental screams mm -hmm. that then live in their dreams for days or weeks to come when they get back to the village. So on and so forth. They're dementors, Harry. Yeah, or whatever. You know, like... So the idea here is there's plenty of ways where I can sew this set piece into my game mm -hmm. and begin that process of bringing the players from uh, a, a place of classic D&D &D game mm -hmm. to, oh, shit, the world is completely different. Yeah, yeah. yeah that you, yours is, is much more of a gun on the mantle kind of monster than mine is. Gun on the mantle. Both of ours are sort of, they're there mm -hmm. until they're ready to be used. Mm. But yours is definitely a... Uh, it's a gun on the mantle. It's right there. It's on the top of the building. Got it. We're, we're going to gain about five to eight levels, and then we're going to interact with that gun gotcha. on the mantle. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. You should Mine have sort of at like, the beginning of the is movie. Is something wrong? Yeah, yeah. What's going on here? Oh, yeah. shit. Wow. I've been having some rough dreams. Have you been having rough yeah, dreams? Yeah. Wow. We've all been having some rough <laughs> dreams around here. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Yeah. So um, We don't I, all have adventure PTSD. It must be something else. <laughs> So yeah, I, li I like the idea of uh, both of us creating monsters just naturally mm -hmm. that that aren't meant to be one and done monster of the week kind of guys. They're sort of like meant to be milked and stretch out and inform mm -hmm. the story as a whole. And that's uh, that's how I want to run. That's how I want to play. That's exactly. the kind of books I want to read. That's uh, a that, that's that's it's the pretty cool. That I eat it's from. pretty cool. Yeah, call it weird. Call it what you will. Yeah, and I think that's probably where we will leave you goblins. It's been a long episode already, so we don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Tell your friends about our podcast. It's the best way to support us. Get us out there. Tell us. Tell your friends and all your other Pathfinder nerds, all your other Pathfinder goblins, where to find us. Tell everybody we suck. Tell them why and tell them they need to watch us to understand. Yes. And as always, gentle goblins, keep, keep it, it weird. weird.